Well, that is really interesting because historians one day will look back at the times that we are living in and they will decide, is the Western Empire, is it, is it already done? What do you think about that? Well, I wouldn't be at all surprised. See, this is a very interesting point you raise here. This because when Odoacer... All right, so Robert Spencer, thank you so much for being here with me. It's great to have you. Uh, you're director of jihadwatch.org. I've been reading your work for a very long time, author of several books. The latest book is Empire of God, How the Byzantines Saved Civilization. So this is something that's a little bit different than the books that you've authored before. So why don't you start by telling me what's the premise of this book? The, uh, it's really just a history of the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire, which uh, is the Roman Empire full stop, really. It's uh, often referred to as the Byzantine Empire to distinguish it from the earlier Roman Empire. And there's a certain logic to that because, of course, the Roman Empire was centered in Rome. And then it was in the fourth century considered to be too big to manage from one place by one emperor. And so a second capital was established in the east in Constantinople. And while the Western Empire fell in 476, the Eastern Empire went on for nearly a thousand more years. And they always considered themselves the Roman Empire, never referred to themselves as the Byzantines. And it was only after the empire fell that they started to be called the Byzantines. So anyway... I wrote this book as an introduction to the Roman or Byzantine aspect of the Roman Empire, partly in view of the fact that Americans and English-speaking people in general don't know history these days. There are a lot of lessons we can learn from history. A lot of fascinating things come out of the Roman Empire, including its Byzantine period, and yet most people don't know anything about it at all. I remember a good friend, when I told him I was starting this project last year, he said, what do you mean, like Socrates and Plato? And he had no <laughs> idea when the Byzantine Empire was. So anyway, a lot of things we can learn from them, and that was the idea of the book. Well, I think that that's great. I've started reading the book. I love it so far. I haven't had time to finish it because I've been moving around, um, but I'm really, really intrigued by it. And yes, I agree. I don't know all of this history. I think most people growing up in my generation have no idea what the Byzantine Empire is. It's just a word that they've heard in some history lesson at some point in their life that they memorized a little bit about for an exam and then forgot about. But yeah. you, <laughs> but what you argue here, and you say this kind of in the foreword of the book, you say, you say there's a great deal more to the legacy of the Byzantine Empire than all this derision would suggest, because many people are derisive when it comes to describing this empire. So the Byzantines were part of the intellectual, cultural, and spiritual heritage of the Western world. While the Roman Catholic Church is often referred to as the Western Church and the Greek Orthodox Church as the Eastern Church, the Judeo-Christian tradition is the foundation of Western civilization, and that includes Eastern Christianity. For centuries now, Western Europeans and North Americans have assumed Benzantium to be a foreign civilization, Christian at least in some form, but fundamentally alien. In reality, it has a closer kinship with the West than with any other culture or civilization, and is a key element in the complex of thought that created Western civilization itself. And so you argue that there are lessons here that we can use now to save our own civilization. Yeah, and actually, that's one of them right there, that uh, people think of it as some alien thing that is distinct from anything that has to do with our own lives or our own civilization or the Western world as we know it. That's actually a recurring theme throughout the book. It was the friction between Western Europe and Constantinople, uh, the capital of the, of the Eastern Roman or Byzantine Empire. It was the friction between the two and the tendency to see each other as alien instead of as allies as they should have been 
that ultimately brought about the downfall of the empire. And it was the unity between the two that gave us the Enlightenment, the Renaissance, many things that are the intellectual foundations of Western thought to this day. So we can learn from a great deal from that in general. But one of the things that we should try to keep in mind is that unity in the face of mortal threats would be wise to pursue instead of the increasing divisions we see in our own society today. Yeah, and I would definitely like to get into that a little bit later in the podcast to talk about, you know, our current threats that we are facing now. But let's go, let's, let's go into a kind of a deep dive into your book, a little bit of a history lesson for me, for our audience here. What, what exactly was the Roman Empire? Most people just think, oh, the Roman Empire, the decline of the Roman Empire, and that's it. You know, they just, they know the ending, but they, or, you know, maybe not even, but they just think of it kind of, that's all. And, and then we moved on. So how did it actually start the Roman Empire? Well, it starts actually with the founding of the city of Rome, which is a semi-historical, semi-mythological event that took place in 753 BC. And the story is that there were two orphans who were raised by wolves, and their names were Romulus and Remus. And they grew up and built a city, and Romulus killed Remus in a dispute over the city and became its undisputed ruler, and he named it after himself Rome, as in Romulus. And so the city of Rome quickly began to expand in a series of wars with its neighbors and ultimately came to rule over a large expanse of territory and was a kingdom. The kingdom was followed by a republic, and this is where people might be familiar with some of the people involved because one of the leading figures of the Roman Republic was a guy named Julius Caesar who was killed by a number of senators because they thought that he was going to make himself into a dictator. But hmm. in the civil war that followed, the upshot was that Julius Caesar's adopted son, Augustus, did become a dictator, although he ultimately took the title of emperor. And this was the beginning of the Roman Empire in 27 BC. And then it was in the 200s, the, the third century, that the, uh, I believe it was the emperor... Diocletian first thought that it, the empire was too much for one man to govern and established the capital in the east. Then Constantine, the first Christian emperor in the early 300s, established his, uh, he moved over to Constantinople himself, and that became the most important city in the empire for the next thousand years. And that is what we think of as the Byzantine Empire, the Roman Empire on from Constantine until its end in 1453. So you talk about in your book as well how the Byzantines didn't think of themselves as Byzantines. They thought of themselves as Romans. Can you talk a little bit about that? Well, it was a very big deal to be a Roman. The Roman Empire was huge at its biggest expanse. It stretched from, Italy, from England to Armenia and also encompassed a great deal of North Africa and the Middle East. And so it was, for many, for in those days, it was most of the known world. And as a matter of fact, the people who were not Romans were routinely called barbarians. Hmm. Now, this was a word initially that just meant they had beards, barba. The, they were be, they were bearded because the Romans, one of the things that they did that demonstrated how civilized they were. See, I'm not a civilized man. Myself. <laughs> they were able to have sophisticated enough blades that they could shave their faces without cutting themselves severely. And so they went around shaving their beards. And this was a sign of their how civilized they were. The bearded mm. people, the barbarians, were the non-Romans who were outside. But the Romans had also a uh, unique practice in the ancient world, which was you could become a Roman citizen, which is um, one thing that's also very instructive 
for uh, the modern world and for the situation of the United States, as well as Western Europe and Canada nowadays, with mass migration of people and no assimilation, no idea that they will take on the customs, mores, principles, and beliefs of the larger population. Mm -hmm. In the Roman Empire, initially, that was unthinkable. Roman citizenship was a great honor and a privilege that one attained, and it was understood that one would act like a Roman and believe like a Roman and behave like a Roman if one was a Roman citizen. And it was only later in the Western Empire, not in the Eastern, not in the Byzantine part, but in the Western Empire that was centered on what was called Old Rome, the city that we know of as Rome in Italy, they uh, stopped. There was a mass migration of Goths, of barbarians, into the empire that people encouraged because they would do work that the that the Romans didn't want to do. They served in the military, and the Romans didn't want to serve in the military. They did all these things that the Romans liked having around, and mm. so they stopped saying, you have to be Roman. And they let them set up their own areas, their own enclaves. They kept their own principles, their own, their own customs, and ultimately they destroyed the empire altogether. And that's, of course, where we're headed now. Yes, I was going to say there are so many parallels that we can draw there with what we're experiencing now. So the Byzantines, they were different, you know, and we can refer to them as Byzantines in this podcast, but in your book, you refer to them as East Romans, correct? Romans, just as Romans. Just, just that's as what, Romans. Yes. Right, they, right. They call themselves that, so I call them that. In all my work, I have done that. People, uh, for example... I've written a lot about Islam and jihad, and people always refer to Islamists or militants or terrorists, and I call them Muslims or jihadis because those are the words they actually use for themselves. And it's just a matter of respect that I call people what they call themselves. So I call the Byzantines or Eastern Romans just Romans. But it's yeah. all the same empire, ultimately, excuse me, just one last little thing. Mm -hmm. When the Romans... When the Western Roman Empire fell in 476, it was because a Goth chieftain, Odoacer, overthrew Romulus Augustulus, who was the last emperor in Rome. And when he did, though, he didn't think, oh, I have destroyed the Roman Empire. The Roman Empire has fallen. He actually immediately sent a declaration of his obedience to the Roman emperor in Constantinople. He did not think he had ended the Roman Empire at all. He just overthrew Romulus and thought, now I will be the Roman Empire's guy over here in Italy. And that didn't work out for a variety of reasons, but nobody was saying, oh, the Roman Empire has fallen. It went on for another thousand years. Well, that is really interesting because historians one day will look back at the times that we are living in and they will decide, you know, is, is the Western Empire... Is it is it already done? You know, uh, what do you think about that? Well, I wouldn't be at all surprised. See, this is a very interesting point you raise here. This because when Odoacer overthrew Romulus, people say that this is 476 in Rome. They say this is the end of the of the Roman Empire, what people usually think of as the Roman Empire. And they don't know that Odoacer paid obeisance to Zeno who was the emperor in Constantinople, the Roman emperor in Constantinople. So if you had been in Rome that day, you would not think the empire has fallen and nobody thought that anything had changed. Everything went on as before. It was only later that historians started to see a fundamental change. Now, hmm. the point I'm leading up to is this. I wouldn't be surprised at all if historians in 500 years or 1,000 years look back and say, the end of the United States was when Joe Biden became president on January 20th, 2021, because then there was a fundamental change. He was the first president who tried to criminalize dissent, who had his principal opponent arrested, who talked about how the people who opposed him were enemies of the republic. And so this was the destruction of the American idea of a two-party system of free society and, and lo loyal opposition. And it can be dated to January 20th, 2021. But 
nobody on that day thought, oh, now the republic is over. That only became clear later. Yeah, and coming from Canada, I would say, you know, it might be when Justin Trudeau came into power and, mm -hmm. and he called Canada a post-nation state, which is quite funny, actually, because yeah. I, I think, you know, and um, the deputy prime minister, Krisha Freeland, has said, you know, we are at this inflection point. We are in this change that only happens once every 500 years, you know. So I think that there is some feeling of a shift and definitely within the populace, there's, you know, we've entered the period of the new normal. And mm -hmm. so we can feel something, but we still consider ourselves citizens of these nation states. None of the, the borders have changed. Um, you know, the, the systems are still in place, but it does feel very different. Oh, yeah. Well, you know, as somebody who's been targeted by the feds, I can tell you that, you know, I grew up believing in the United States, believing in America thinking it was a uniquely moral and, and law-abiding system. And now I think we're governed by a bunch of traitors, criminals, and rogues of various kinds who are using the system they have destroyed and hollowed out, using the appearance of it to pacify the populace and keep them from realizing in large numbers exactly the full magnitude of what they've done. So do you see similarities there with the fall of Rome, not of the Byzantine Empire, but here to discriminate? Do you see any parallels with that? Oh, very much so, yeah. See, uh, like I was saying before about being a Roman citizen and how it was a great honor and a privilege, especially for somebody in one of the conquered territories, somebody way out, is say, in, in, in Iraq or uh, way over in uh, Morocco, or in or in Armenia to go through the process and become a Roman citizen, this was something that gave him a particular distinction. We even see that in the Bible, you know, in the New Testament, when Paul, the apostle, is arrested, he starts to cry out, wait a minute, I'm a Roman citizen. And so he is telling them, look, you can't treat me this way. I'm not just some barbarian that you think you can manhandle. I am hmm. a Roman citizen with all the rights and privileges appertaining thereunto. But nowadays, we think we have grown up thinking that the citizenship in the United States or in Canada or in Britain or France or Germany gave a person certain rights and privileges, and now they are being systematically curtailed and stripped away. And yet, uh, because there's still a presidential election in the U.S. every four years, although the last one was deeply suspicious, and the next one is likely to be just as suspicious, if not more so, uh, is people don't realize that there's been a massive change, a huge disjunction. And this is what happened in Rome. They thought everything was sort of business as usual, but all these Goths had become Roman citizens without really becoming Romans in the way that people were expected to do so before. And ultimately, the disunity that was introduced into society in that way became too corrosive to sustain, and the whole thing fell in. By In 476, people usually date the, the fall of the empire, but as I said, nobody was referring to it then. But Later, in the 500s and 600s, people start talking about how Rome fell back then. Hmm. And, and so it was clear that there had been a big change in Italy in general, in Rome, in the Western Empire, or what was formerly the Western Empire, but it wasn't obvious at the time it was going on. So I guess the big question then is what comes next, but don't answer that right away. Maybe we can save that for later uh, towards the end. But what I'd like to get back to is in your book, you talk about Constantine and his influence. And he has a very interesting story, you know, his character development, you know, his conversion to Christianity and how that had ripple effects to this day, to the Enlightenment and beyond. So can you talk about his story? Oh, yeah. You know, his influence cannot be understated at all. He's one of the most influential people in history. Uh, without him, we can say without any hesitation that uh, the Western world as we know it would not exist, and we probably wouldn't be having this conversation today. So Constantine, as I noted before, actually, was 
the uh, founder, in a certain sense, of the Byzantine Empire, or the Roman Empire in Constantinople, when he uh, moved there and made it the primary capital of the empire. And he was also the first Christian emperor. He, uh, de facto, he did not make Christianity the official religion of the empire. Theodosius did that in 380, a little Mm. bit later. But in 313, he converted and he began moving toward making Christianity the official religion of the empire. And this is the basis for far more than most people think. For example, um, it was after Constantine made Christianity the foremost religion in the empire, and then it was made official by Theodosius, that he won't con- I, I, I'm sorry, getting a little ahead of myself. Constantine, no, that's fine. See, in those days, there were not parliaments and constitutions. There was the Senate, but after the emperor became the emperor, the Senate had much less power than it had had in the Roman Republic. The Senate actually continued in the in the Roman Empire in Constantinople all the way up to the end in 1453, but it was not a powerful or influential body as it had as it had been. And so, what held the empire together was not a system of laws uh, or you know a constitution, a basic document like that, but a common religion. Now, this was the way that empires worked in those days. There were two great powers in the world in the early part of uh, the what we know of as the Common Era or AD, the time after Christ. There were, there was initially, that is, the Roman Empire and the Persian Empire. And the Persians were Zoroastrians, a religion that has It still exists, but is much less uh, extensive than it used to be. And Christianity in the Roman Empire. Now, that Christian faith in the Roman Empire was considered to be the unifying factor and the defining characteristic for what made a Roman citizen in the Christian period of the Roman Empire. So if you were a full Roman citizen, then you were an Orthodox Christian. And that meant that you believed certain things. But what exactly did you believe? Well, Constantine noted that while he had become a Christian, the Christians were all fighting among themselves and disagreeing on basic doctrines. So he told all the bishops to get together and to decide what the Christian faith really was and to hammer it out and write it out and make it clear for everyone. And so the first time they did this was in the city of Nicaea, which was right next to Constantinople. uh, And that was in the year 325, the Council of Nicaea. They wrote out the creed, the basic beliefs of Christianity. And that creed, the Nicene Creed, is still recited in churches of all types every Sunday to this day. It's the sort of the foundational document of Christianity, and it comes from the Byzantine Empire. The empire also was the location of six other councils of that kind, meetings of the, all the world's bishops, where they formulated basic doctrines that Protestants, Catholics, and Orthodox Christians all still believe to this day. But even if you're not a Christian, these things are influential and have a tremendous influence over our world today. For example, the seventh and last of these ecumenical councils that was held also in Nicaea in the year 787, it was about icons. Icons are religious pictures. The uh, Orthodox Church still reveres icons. If you go, I don't know if you've ever been to an Orthodox Church, but if you go in, there are all these pictures everywhere of Jesus and his mother and the saints and so on. And they are designed to communicate the faith in pictures. And they're a very particular stylized kind of drawing. It's not just any kind of picture. And anyway, those are the foundation of Orthodox piety, of Orthodox Christian worship. And of course, in Roman Catholic churches, you have statues, and those are also 
very important in Catholic worship. There were other Christians who said, no, this is wrong. It's idolatrous. You're not supposed to make any graven images. And these are images. And so they're against the commandment that Moses got on Mount Sinai. So the Seventh Ecumenical Council at Nicaea in 787 actually discussed this issue and decided, yes, the pictures are okay for various <laughs> reasons we don't need to get into because this is not a Christian theological discussion. But the point is that that is the basis for representational art in the West. Now, you might think that's crazy. You mean people wouldn't draw pictures if it weren't for that? They wouldn't draw pictures of people. And now I'm serious about this. People don't know this stuff. But if you look at the Islamic world, there are no pictures of people. They don't draw pictures of people. The art is calligraphy and various kinds of uh, arabesques designs that uh, are not representational because any kind of representational art is considered to be a temptation to idolatry. But in the Christian world, in the Byzantine Empire, the, the Roman Empire, they decided at the highest level that the pictures were not inconsistent with the Christian faith and thus were to be encouraged, actually, as aids to worship. Now, it was from that that Western art developed. It all began as religious art. And then you have people starting to think, well, you know, I'm painting pictures of... Uh, Mary and Jesus. I could paint this lady over here, Mona Lisa. What's the problem? I'll just paint her too. And mm -hmm. uh, all of uh, the, the tremendous artistic heritage of the Western world right up to the modern age comes out of that. And so if, if they had decided in another direction and said, you can't have representational art, I'm not saying it would not have existed, but it would not have been nearly as extensive or as encouraged as it was because the church in in Western Europe, as well as in the empire, was extremely powerful all through the Middle Ages. And if they had said that this was not to go, it most of the, mostly would not have been around. So Michelangelo might have been out of commission, is what you're saying here. Yeah. And yeah. all of these great works of art, we wouldn't have them. Precisely. That's it. And so wow. we owe it to the Byzantine Empire and to the Seventh Ecumenical Council, which most people don't even know existed. They have no idea of any of this. That's incredible. And I definitely urge anybody listening to read your book because they will get a detailed lesson in history, but it's told really in a story-like fashion, and I find it very accessible. So it's, it's really a great read. And so I got to the part about Constantine and his understanding of Christianity at that time being something that you relate to humanism. So there's kind of like the non-aggression principle, almost the foundation for that is in there. He was saying, you know, we're not going to convert everybody to Christianity if they don't want to. Like, let's let them do what they want to do. And if we let them do what they want to do, they're probably going to figure out that this is the best thing for them. So that, you know, is very, very different than what we see, for example, in Islam, who wanted to conquer by the sword. So you really see that kind of dichotomy is drawn out by looking into the story of the Byzantines. So can you yes. expand a little bit on those ideas, the humanism and other aspects that were brought forth? Yes, yeah, see, this is also another thing. People are very concerned nowadays about individual rights, although, of course, there's also this very ominous rise in collectivism, which will overwhelm individual rights if we're not careful. But in any case, um, there's a tremendous sense nowadays of the individual's autonomy, uh, such that, you know, if somebody decides he wants to change genders or whatever, then this is just fine and all, all together to be encouraged. And so uh, there is perhaps a way that this has gone too far but nonetheless, the idea is rooted in the principle of the dignity of the human person, the individual dignity of every human being. And, excuse me, not just as members of some collective, but in his or her own right, simply by virtue of being a human being. And this comes from the Christian understanding of human beings being made in the image of God. And... Here again, this is something, you know, people talk, I say, I got my rights and, and, and demand their, 
various things without realizing that this is something that comes from the Christian tradition, particularly as it was elaborated by Constantine and those following. And the respect for the freedom of conscience, <clears throat> excuse me, emanates directly from that. Because obviously, if you say a human being is made in the image of God, and thus has value in and of himself or herself, then to say that we're going to override, however, his or her conscience and force the, this individual to believe this or that would be incompatible with the first statement. If the person has dignity and rights as being made in the image of God, then that includes the dignity and the right to determine in good conscience what he or she believes to be true. And this was something, now I'm not saying, of course, that in Christian Europe or in the Roman Empire itself, that this was always and in every case respected. There were many cases where it was thought that it was, it was understood that if the emperor or the king in some area uh, has a religion, then everybody has to follow it. But there was also a, a tremendous respect for the freedom of conscience that you do not have, as you noted, in the Islamic world, and <clears throat> that is often not present in the Islamic world to this day, where we find many people, uh, for example, having left Islam, and they can't declare that openly because they'd be killed, because yeah. Islam is a death penalty for apostasy that Christianity has never had. So I actually had two prominent ex-Muslims come on to this podcast, Yasmin Mohammed and Brother Rashid. And they spoke to me about a lot of these things. And Brother Rashid studied theology, studied religion. He converted to Christianity. Um, and what he said was that Islam from the source is evil. And, you know, if you want to call it evil, or it's in the doctrines of Islam, to commit violence in the name of God, whereas you see the opposite in Christianity. And what I noticed in the comments section of these videos is what a lot of people argue is, well, look what was done in the name of Christianity. Look at the Crusades. How do you differentiate these two things, Robert? Yeah, the Crusades actually play a big part in this book. And the Crusaders don't always come off so well. Because, uh, as I explain in the book, the Crusades actually happened because the Roman Emperor, Alexios Komnenos, appealed for help from the West when the Muslims had conquered a significant portion of the Roman Empire, and it looked like they were going to take the whole thing. This is in the 1070s, 1080s. There was a disastrous battle uh, that uh, Romulus IV one of the predecessors of the Emperor Alexios, he was uh, sort of a Joe Biden type, um, <laughs> way over his head and uh, more frivolous than substantive. And he wanted a great military victory. So he led the entire Roman army out to what is now Eastern Turkey in 1071, and at a city called Manzikert, suffered a tremendous defeat. The whole army was smashed, and the Turks were able to just advance after that into Asia Minor, which was the heartland of the Byzantine Roman Empire, and occupy it. And of course, they're still there. That's Turkey. Uh, and so in the 1090s, Alexios... See, that's also because that was where the farms were. That was where the farm boys were. And so that's where the potential soldiers were. And so now this area was being conquered. You, he couldn't, Alexios couldn't even build back his army to try to fight the Muslims again hmm. and recapture the territory. So he appealed for help from the West. And it was an answer to that appeal that the first crusade happened. But wow. the crusaders were initially bound to return any land they conquered to the Roman Empire because it was Roman land. But they didn't. They established their own kingdoms instead. And ultimately, the Fourth Crusade in the year 1204 
actually sacked the city of Constantinople and destroyed the empire in uh, aiding a claimant to the Roman throne as over against somebody else who was claiming it. And so <clears throat> the Crusades, in other words, are a very a decidedly mixed bag for the Roman Empire. But there is no doubt that they were a defensive action, that they were a response to the Muslim aggression against the Roman Empire, and not some, nowadays people think of them as some exercise in imperialism, that the mm -hmm. evil white man came from Europe and... Uh, gratuitously attacked the noble brown man and that's the mythology of today but it's a lot of hooey there's in in the first place uh the whole white brown distinction this was not the way people thought in those days and the whole concept of race as we think of it today comes much later these were romans and they thought of themselves as romans and were very proud of themselves as romans but they didn't think oh we're white and we're going to go and uh, it's, it's, the, 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 nobody was thinking that way. But anyway, the uh, Muslims had been committing acts of aggression for 450 years and had conquered the Roman territory in the Middle East and North Africa and Islamized those regions, and there had been no pushback at all. And so the Crusaders coming from Western Europe were a defensive attempt to try to recapture just a portion of that territory so that Christian pilgrims to the Holy Land would be safe going there to visit the sites where the Lord had lived. And this was the idea of the Crusades. Um, the idea that people have of the Crusades now is completely ahistorical. Now that's not to say the Crusaders didn't do anything wrong. They conquered Jerusalem in 1099 and they burnt down a synagogue full of people because they didn't like Jews. And the Jews had nothing to do with the reason why they were there. That was a disastrous uh, and a heinous crime that was actually condemned not only by the Roman emperor, but by the Pope over in Rome and uh, the Roman emperor in Constantinople, that is. And so uh, nobody was actually in favor of the excesses of the Crusaders and condemned them and tried to make amends. But uh, <clears throat> in the main, the idea that the Crusades were some terrible thing is only said by people who don't really know the history of what was going on at the time. That's a great, great explanation. And, and it's funny because, you know, Rene Girard talks about this kind of idea of self-defense then becoming revenge. You know, so there's that danger. And that's what it kind of sounds like you're describing here with these crusades is that they began as as an action of self-defense, but then later kind of took on a new life uh, throughout the centuries. So if we can just kind of draw a, a, a map, a map for our audience here, thinking about the fall of the Western Roman Empire, 476 AD, and then we have... Islam, Muhammad, this is in the 600s, and you have the Byzantines still going, you know, mm -hmm. until almost 1500. So what did that all look like when Islam began, when Muhammad declared himself a prophet? What, what was it like, you know, in, in the whole of civilization? Like, how was there um, an opportunity for him to do something like this? Yeah. Uh, in the 600s, as I noted before, actually, there were two great empires in the world, two great powers, the Roman Empire in Constantinople and the Persian Empire that was in what is now Iran and Iraq. And they, in the early 600s, they fought a series of wars against each other. And the Roman Emperor Heraclius, at one point, was on the verge of surrendering because the Persians were at the, they were at the Bosporus, the strait that is in, uh, right, right next to Constantinople, which is now Istanbul, of course. And they were looking into Constantinople and it looked like it was all done, that the Roman Empire was finished and was going to fall. <clears throat> but Heraclius was able to raise money mostly by um, 
getting money from the churches. And he actually went into the churches and took their gold chalices and things like that and melted them down for coinage and for weapons and uh, for coinage to buy weapons and was able to recruit and equip a new army by essentially despoiling the church. But the church, they knew that what was at stake as well. And so there wasn't any protests on that score. And <clears throat> Heraclius began to defeat the Persians and drive them back from Constantinople. And he was so successful, he made it all the way to the Persian capital but was unable to get in. And so it was a parallel situation where the Roman, em the Persian emperor was right there about to take Constantinople, but he couldn't seal the deal. And then Heraclius returned the favor and was right at Tessaphon, the Persian capital, and couldn't seal the deal. And what happened was both empires ended up being exhausted. And you know how the Chinese today talk about a paper tiger? And they say America is a paper tiger. They've been saying this since Vietnam. It hmm. looks a lot stronger than it really is, hmm. which is probably true in these days of Biden. But in any way, <laughs> any case, uh, the Roman and the Persian empires in the early 600s were both paper tigers. And it's an interesting thing. The Romans had a series of forts along the border in the Middle East and in Arabia and Northern Arabia, they did not control Arabia itself, what is today Saudi Arabia, but they were right there next to it in Syria, Jordan, that area, Egypt, all that was Roman territory. And they had all these forts along the border. But after all these wars with the Persians, they didn't have enough troops to put troops in every fort. And so they had roving bands of troops that would go from fort to fort. And otherwise, large areas of the border would be empty, mm -hmm. would be completely unguarded because they, the, the army would move on to the next fort, you see, and they didn't have enough troops to keep at every fort. So there's a story in Islamic tradition. <clears throat> now, I've written a lot about the historical value of Islamic tradition, which is essentially zero, but there are... Um, clearly some things that hark back to events that really occurred. And I think this is one of them, that Muhammad is supposed to, this is a ninth century story. That is a story from the 800s. And Muhammad is supposed to have died in 632. So it's 200 years after Muhammad. And that's one of the reasons why I'm saying it's not historical. But it's an interesting story. And I think there must be some truth to it somehow that Muhammad in the year 630 decides to go and fight the Romans. Now, this is something new for the Muslims. They have never taken on the big empire. Mm -hmm. And the, now they're going to take on the Romans. <clears throat> and so it's the, hot, the, 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 the heat of summer. It's the middle of summer, and you're in Arabia. So it's about 120 degrees out, and they don't have air conditioning. They don't have the limos that they have now. They are on horseback. So the Quran speaks about this, an Islamic tradition speaks about this, that a lot of the Muslims said, no, I'm not going on this one. It's just too hot. And they get very harshly scolded by Muhammad in the Quran. But anyway, they go, some of them, and they get to the Byzantine fort in Tabuk, which is in northern Arabia, still there, and there are no Romans there. Nobody's there. And the Muslims say, see, they are so afraid of us, they fled. No, they just didn't have enough troops to stock every fort along the border. And it happened that when they get there, there's nobody there. But that's a very bad thing to do when you have a hostile enemy on your border. And the Arabs had unified in the, in the time that is attributed to be the time of Muhammad. And they were, they, they were now a single force. They were energetic and uh, pugnacious, aggressive, and the Persians and the Romans were exhausted and weak. Mm -hmm. What happened? The 630s, boom, they come out of Arabia, they conquer North Africa, 
just like that, roll it up pretty, you know, with it, it seems like within minutes they're in Morocco. It, it, it went so fast. It just rolled up like nothing because the Romans didn't have enough troops to defend it. Same thing in the Middle East. Syria fell. Palestine fell. The area that's now Jordan fell. Iraq fell. They attacked the Persian Empire. The Persian Empire falls like that. And suddenly they've got this huge empire. And they still have it. It's, you know, the whole Arab-speaking world from Morocco to Iran. Iran's not Arabic-speaking, but I mean right up to the borders of Iran. And that is the empire they amassed in the 7th century. And it was largely, aside from the Persian areas, it was Roman territory that they were able to conquer because of the weakness of the Romans. Oh, this is just fascinating. And I've read a, a really extensive book about the history of Islam kind of from the start, from Muhammad. And it's my understanding that, uh, you know, Muhammad kind of went out there. He was basically like kind of schizophrenic, um, sociopathic. Nobody wanted to listen to him. Uh, he would go and, and, and try and convince everybody. Uh, was it in Medina or in Mecca that, that Mecca. he... It was in Mecca, right, that, that he was, you know, God's last prophet, etc. And then when he was no longer successful, or when, when he wasn't successful at, at convincing people of this, it was then that he decided to rally all the vandals and the petty criminals and kind of, you know, get them to join his cult, in a sense. And then they would go and pillage and rob and murder and do all of these things and just force them their way into different spots by breaking all of the the rules at the time too right like the arabic trading rules and you know you can't fight during these months of the year and you know breaking all of those rules and just going in there and conquering but then it was amazing to me how that spread like a wildfire and how that grew into this totalitarian system and this massive yeah. army. And so what you're talking about here now, this this that you were just describing happened in which year? In the, it's in the early 600s. And it's in the 630s that after Muhammad is supposed to have died in 632, that they come out and conquer all this territory so quickly. By the 660s, they controlled everything from Morocco through, through into India. And uh, by 732, 100 years after Muhammad is supposed to have died, they've got Spain all the way to ma major parts of India, all across North Africa and the Middle East, including Iran. So that's incredible. You think about the Roman Empire and all of the, the time that went to creating it and maintaining it and all of its traditions and civilization. And you think it takes a few decades for it to yeah. start to become attacked in that way. Like how, how do you, how do, what's your understanding of that? How does that happen? Well, I, I think that it's primarily because it was just bad luck on the part of Heraclius. Heraclius is one of the most heroic and most tragic figures of all of history that he uh, saved the Roman empire and defeated its foremost enemy, the Persians and at the greatest moment of his triumph, it was all snatched away from him by this other foe that nobody had been paying attention to and had not been a serious threat to anybody before that. And so by the time he died, everything that he had fought to accomplish had been destroyed. And uh, it's, you know, it's, well, that's just the way life is. I actually have a book myself, The History of Jihad, that details all of this and more. And it's sort of the, the history of the, uh, what we're talking about in regard to the Byzantine Empire from the other perspective, hmm. the perspective of the jihadis. And um, they saw an opportunity and they took it. They saw that the Roman Empire was weak and they advanced as far as they could. They first besieged Constantinople in 675. Uh, which is after Heraclius died, but it's really astonishingly fast that suddenly they're besieging the capital of the greatest power on earth. And that's only 40 years after people just first started to hear them. And they uh, destroyed the other great power on earth, Persia, even before that.
<clears throat> so this is something to think about now, I think, especially, Robert, because we see how quickly things are escalating right now in the West with the Islamist threat. Or wait, you don't call it the Islamist threat. You just call it the Muslim threat using their yeah. language. Yes. So, I mean, what I find interesting about October 7th is that many people say, oh, Israel did this, they did this to themselves, they planned it, they were a part of it. Uh, somehow you hear that, you know, from certain people, or you just hear the far left who are just kind of cheering for it because, you know, Israel, they're the colonizers, when in fact, as you mentioned, uh, the colonizers are actually quite different. They're, they're still in Constantinople today. <laughs> but um, what's interesting about that is that I think there's a parallel in the way that Israel, being part of the West, was weakened in the last few years. Do you think that that played a role in those attacks of being able to, to be successful? Oh yeah, there's no doubt about that whatsoever. On October 8th, I believe it was Fathi Hamad, uh, a, 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 in any case, a senior Hamas leader. I may not be remembering if it's the right guy, but anyway, senior Hamas leader went on Russia Today, the Russian television network, and he's boasting about how they planned this for two years and they deceived the Israelis. They told the Israelis, we're too busy governing Gaza to fight you. We're, uh, <clears throat> we're going to take care of our people first. Mm -hmm. And the Israelis bought it when they should have been aware that Muhammad, the prophet of Islam, said war is deceit. And they should not have trusted these people. But in Israel, just as in the United States and in Europe, uh, they don't pay any attention to Islamic doctrine. They don't think that it has anything to do with the current conflicts. If you read, however, what Fatah writes, what Hamas writes, what every last jihad group writes, it's all about Islam. And yet that's the one thing that everybody in the West ignores when it comes to the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. And actually it's the same thing with the Byzantines. Uh, they should have known about Islam. They were the first great power to encounter Islam. John of Damascus, who is considered a saint in the Orthodox Church, I believe in the Catholic Church as well, uh, he was the one of the first non-Muslims to write about Islam in the early 700s. And yet Roman emperors throughout history, you can see it in the book, they make agreements with Muslim leaders they try to make peace. They have no idea what Islam is all about. And they end up making these agreements that are to their disadvantage and ultimately cause harm to the people of the empire. It's the same thing. The Israelis believed Hamas. They even moved troops over to the West Bank where they thought there was more of a disturbance. And then, they, uh, and then Hamas had a free hand on October 7th to break down the border fence and go into Israel in large numbers. So what happened during the period of the Roman Empire when there were the Arab invasions? Is that what you were detailing before? Are there any more um, invasions that you didn't mention yet? Oh, very much so, yeah. Uh, the Arabs, of course, they give way to the Turks, but the Turks were Muslims as well. And the, you have, like I actually already mentioned, the Battle of Manzikert, where the Emperor Romulus IV Romanos, not Romulus, Ro sorry, Romanos the IV uh, led the Roman Empire, the Roman army, to a disastrous defeat at Manzikert in what is today eastern Turkey. And that was the beginning of the Turkish conquest and the Islamization of what we think of as Turkey today. Those people come from Central Asia. It's a funny thing, though. Uh, Islam says that Islam teaches that non-Muslims, particularly Jews and Christians, are free to live as Jews and Christians in the Islamic State as long as they submit to Muslim rule, accept various discriminatory rules, pay a special tax that the Muslims don't pay, and accept a second-class status. And so a lot of the Jews and Christians in the Roman Empire they accepted this, but all that you had to do to be free of it was to convert to Islam, and then you'd be a full citizen of the caliphate 
and you didn't have to pay the tax. You didn't have to suffer the discrimination. And so this is how they converted most of the people who are Muslims in the Middle East today. Egypt, for example, was 99% Christian when it was part of the Roman Empire. Now it's 6 to 10% Christian. Did all the Christians leave? No, they just converted over the years because it was the way pathway to a better life in Egypt when it was Islamic. In Turkey, a lot of Christians became Muslims. And nowadays, it's a very funny thing that's happening. A lot of Turks nowadays are discovering things like Ancestry.com and those sites where you send in some blood or spit or whatever it is you yeah. send. And you, uh, uh, they, they examine your DNA and tell you what your ethnicity is. And they're finding to their horror that they're Greeks or Armenians. And they thought they were Turks from Central Asia who migrated over. But actually, the number of Turks who migrated over is, is, is pretty small compared to the number of people who consider themselves Turks today who are actually conquered Christians who converted to Islam. And they were Greeks or Armenians. So <clears throat> the Turks are now discovering the ain't Turkish. And it's become this big scandal in Turkey so that they're even talking about outlawing those genealogy tests oh my gosh yeah 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 no you you can't know about this right you just yeah. keep with your yeah. ideas that you already have in your mind the truth is not important right like the pursuit of truth is not important uh and that's a big exactly. difference i think that's a big difference when we look at the roman empire especially what it became you know after constantine and after it became christianized it was like these ideals and the pursuit of truth Probably, you would probably consider one of these ideals, right? And then in the Islamic world, you have the opposite, deceit, as you said. And so you have this kind of clash of these two, of these two different, you know, civilization versus, I guess you could say, the bearded people, right? The barbarians. They were the, the, the new barbarians, in a sense. So, yeah. so how do you argue then? How did the Byzantines save civilization from all of this? Well, for one thing, they did hold out for 800 years against constant Islamic Jihad. Uh, first, it was the Arabs, as I said, and then the Turks. The Turks ultimately did, the Ottoman Turks conquered the empire on Tuesday, May 29th, 1453, and broke into Constantinople for the first time, pillaged the blood was flowing everywhere in the streets as they were just killing people indiscriminately. They made Hagia Sophia, the great cathedral in Constantinople, into a mosque, which, of mm -hmm. course, it is to this day, although mm -hmm. it was a museum for 88 years up until 2020. And uh, the uh, whole city, the whole area was Islamized. It's interesting to know that when, when you're talking about the commitment to the truth, that that is a fundamental dichotomy. And it's not just the, um, what was it that you said? The, uh, I'm sorry, it's escaping me. But in any case, the point is that the Quran says in chapter 5, verse 101, don't ask too many questions because asking questions has made some people lose their faith. Hmm. Whereas the New Testament says, always be ready to give a defense for the hope that is within you. Now, that's a complete opposite. And there's a certain anti-intellectualism, and a fundamentalism that sticks only to the Quran in Islam. And in Christianity, there are strains of Christianity that are like that, but it's much more open to intellectual inquiry. And not only was that intellectual inquiry made possible in Europe by the Romans holding their line against the jihadis for 800 years, but also the basis for that intellectual inquiry in Western Europe comes from the East as well. Because, you know, you think back at what are the intellectual foundations of Western civilization? If anybody has thought about it at all, they'd probably say the ancient Greeks, Plato, Socrates, Aristotle, and so on. Mm -hmm. Now, how do we know what the ancient Greeks taught? because of the Romans. 
the Romans, this was part of their curriculum. They didn't mess with their curriculum and have fads and teach critical race theory and all this nonsense. They had the same curriculum all the way through the empire from before the 300s to 1453. And they taught these classics. In Western Europe, they only had two books of Plato. They did not know, they didn't have the other books. This is before printing. And every book had to be copied out by hand. And if you wanted to read Plato in, 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 in France in 1400, there, was two, there were two books. That was it. And so what happened was the Council of Florence. This is all in the book. In 1439, there was an attempt to reunite the Roman Church and the Orthodox Church. That is the Church of Rome and the Church of Constantinople. And the two of them met in Florence, the city in Italy. And in Florence, the Roman emperor came, as well as the ecumenical patriarch, that is the Bishop of Constantinople, and the Pope. Uh, I'm not sure the Pope was there or he was presiding through legates or whatever. But anyway, highest level meeting of the of the officials of the Roman Catholic Church and the officials of the Orthodox Church and the Roman Emperor right there. And the Roman Emperor had a friend who was a philosopher, a Platonist, and his name was Gemistos Plathon. And so he said, hey, come along with me to Florence for this council. It'll be great. We'll have fun. But Gemistos was not a Christian theologian. So he ended up in Florence and there's all these deliberations going on at the bishops and he was bored. He had nothing to do with that part. So he's a Platonist philosopher. He started giving lectures in Florence on Plato and Aristotle and Socrates and all the, the whole ancient Greek philosophical tradition. And the Florentines, the Italians, were astonished. They were enthralled. They had never heard of this stuff. And he was packing them in and getting huge crowds for these lectures on Plato. And other people started to speak about Plato. Then, this was not long before the empire fell in 1453, when the Muslims finally were able to enter and destroy Constantinople. And when they did that, a great many professors, scholars, scientists, philosophers, theologians, they made their way from Constantinople. They moved into Italy. They moved to France. They moved to England because they didn't want to live conquered under the Muslims in Constantinople. And so suddenly there are all these scholars of this stuff that the Western Europeans have no idea about. And they start teaching it. And this was the beginning of the Renaissance in Western Europe. And this is what sparked the Renaissance and the Enlightenment, the idea of the rights of man, from which comes the American Revolution. That's incredible. And then there's also with that, you have the combination of the Gutenberg printing press, which is around 1452, isn't it? Yeah. And so, so those things are coming together all at once. So you have the Christians who are speaking now with these Aristotelians and wow. So you have this explosion, you know, have everybody kind of talking together and exchanging ideas. You have now people are able to buy books. How long did it take when you had the Gutenberg printing press before the masses, so to speak, were able to, to start reading? And, and how did that contribute as well? Well, it happens very quickly. Once you have the printing press, then there was a tremendous demand for the books. And there weren't very many books, you know. And when we think of books today, there are millions of them. And people don't really, you know, you, you can spend your life reading and read a lot of garbage and not really get to the good stuff. But in those days, because books had to be copied out by hand, a great deal of the ancient literature is lost because it wasn't valued enough to be preserved. And the things that were valued were copied painstakingly by hand. And then immediately, once the printing press is invented, then you have, especially because people were just now hearing that there was this Plato who had written all these books and Aristotle, these things started to be printed almost immediately. 
and they transform the intellectual environment of the West and create the grounds by which, well, th that's why we're here today. So that's incredible. So at the same time, now you have the Byzantine Empire now is, is collapsing from invasion from the Muslims. Mm -hmm. You have the Enlightenment and the Renaissance in the Western part, what was formerly the Western part of the empire. Yes. And so all that area that had been overwhelmed by barbarians and governed by barbarians for the intervening nearly a thousand years, now the light shifts back to that area. And the Roman Empire in Constantinople and its former holdings, the, the whole area of the Middle East, of Turkey, of what we think of as Turkey today, that is, uh, of uh, North Africa, that is all under the rule of Islam and is completely Islamized. Whereas in the West, there's this tremendous intellectual ferment that ultimately results in the idea of secular republics, of P the equality of rights of all people before the law. These things have never been considered to be automatic or uh, just in the air. They come out of the intellectual tradition that the West owes to the Roman Empire and I mean specifically the one in Constantinople that preserved all the literature from which it is derived. So now maybe Christa Freeland, and Joe Biden said it too, that we are at this inflection point. Maybe they're actually correct, but maybe it's not exactly what they think that it's going to be. I don't know if you've read uh, Martin Gurry's book, The Revolt of the Public. No, I haven't. Sounds great. Though. I, would, I would recommend it for sure. Uh, he talks about how the age of information could be likened to a second renaissance. Like we might need to go through some difficult times before we get there, but the invention of the internet has totally changed the ways that we consume information, the way that we share information. You know, we're able to have this conversation. We would have had to have some kind of facilitator in the past, right? Now we're able to speak to anybody. It's it's kind of like the Gutenberg printing press on steroids. That's what I like to call it. <laughs> so, so yeah, I that's a very good point. That's we would have to convince somebody who had a show that we had something worth saying. And if the gatekeepers didn't think we did, then we'd be out of luck. And now you can have a show, and we can have this discussion. Never would have been featured before. So that yeah. It's amazing, really, what's happened. Yeah, that's right. And, and I think that that's also a large part of the reason that we see so much censorship and we see that there's kind of this cracking down. Um, so so there's. it seems like there is this mix of things that are going on again, like you were just describing around, you know, the... 1500 or so just before that it kind of does feel like we are at a similar place and so what are the kinds of lessons you know from our conversation from what i just said about the internet and and from the Byzantines? what are the lessons that we can learn now and that we can adopt when it comes to facing our current civilizational threats and maybe what are what are the biggest threats to you as well well you know uh I think that one of the things that we should guard against or try to guard against in dealing with the challenges of the age in which we live is to avoid reinventing the wheel and to understand that the civilizations that have gone before us, including the Romans, maybe especially the Romans, do have something to say to us, that we are not sui generis, we're not... Uh, of our uh, cut off from our own history and our own heritage. History is a weapon nowadays, you know? And the tearing down of statues by the left is designed to make us ashamed of our history and willing to have our system that is based on that history to be replaced. And so we need to recover an appreciation for our history. As I said at the very beginning of this, that's one of the reasons why I wrote this book, that we need to understand on whose shoulders we're standing and gain what we can from them. And there are tremendous lessons that we can learn from them. Like, for example, nowadays, of course, there's galloping inflation. And that's uh, courtesy of Joe Biden's fiscal policies and 
you know, massive debt spending and the proliferation of printing of money without anything backing it. Do you know that the, the, the Roman Empire was so stable in Constantinople for a thousand years, for 700 of those years, it had the currency the currency had exactly the same value. So that would be like if the dollar today was worth exactly as much, no more or less than it was since the year 1324. It would just boggle the mind to imagine that. But if you think about it, the more you think about it, the wilder it becomes. It's a, quite a rabbit hole because if you imagine if, you grew up and your parents and your grandparents and, and everybody around you grew up. And as long as anybody could remember, the money was worth exactly what it is today. And so you could just sit back and think, I need to make X amount in order to buy a house and a car and have a comfortable living. Mm -hmm. And, and you, you could get there. Yes wouldn't have to worry about your savings being swept away because the money is only worth 50% of what it used to be. You know, um, when I was a kid, I thought my dad made a lot of money. And nowadays, he makes so much less money. And it's, it's astonishing to me how little he actually made. And then I looked it up and I saw that the dollar in 1973, the 2024 dollar is worth 14% of what the dollar was worth in 1973. And so the stability that that would have brought to a society and that it did bring to Roman society, maybe that's something we should look at. And that might be the foundation of a new stable society that might arise out of the chaos we're going through now and headed for now. You see, I didn't know that actually. What I did know was that the Western Roman Empire debased their currency during towards the end of the empire, right? They started diluting the coins mm -hmm. and making them less valuable. And um, some people say that that is part of what contributed to the decline. So that's maybe another mm -hmm. parallel that we can draw from now with all of this debasement of currency that, that you just described there. I think, I think it, it's a huge, huge factor. Um, I, what I've, what I've kind of realized over the last few years is that I don't think that you can separate economic opportunity or economic liberty from personal liberty and flourishing. Like once you lose one of them, the other one is going to go like they pair together. Mm -hmm. And so I definitely see that as well. And what about Robert, when it comes to uh, the threat of Islam, I watched you did a great show with Andrew Clavin, who I love as well. I've been watching for many, many years. Uh, he's great and very wise man. <laughs> and what yeah. I liked about that was, you know, Clavin was asking you some questions about, you know, what do we do? How do we deal with immigration? What do we do with with Islam? And and you are just unapologetic. And I love that because I'm kind of the same way. Like, it's like once you figure something out, you keep trying to find more answers, you know, and that's what I'm doing. I'm learning as much as I can. But so far, what I understand is exactly what you said. So for anybody in this audience who hasn't seen that, that episode with Andrew Clavin, what is your answer to dealing with immigration right now, mass immigration, um, dealing with or indiscriminate immigration, let's say, um, dealing with the threat of Islam? What do we do? Well, there should be no immigration without assimilation, without the understanding that the person is going to adopt American laws, is going to obey American laws. There's not going to be any exceptions. Now, you might think, oh, that's taken for granted. That's uh, No, it isn't, actually. And it's not specifically when it comes to Islam, because Islam allows for polygamy. A man can have as many as four wives. Now, polygamy is officially illegal in the United States. However, there are thousands of Muslims in the United States right now, and this is by the admission of Ibrahim Hooper of the Council on American Islamic Relations, and they are polygamists, they're in polygamous arrangements, and nobody bothers them mm -hmm. because they don't want to appear racist and Islamophobic. And so in the first place, we should enforce our own laws, and that in, in tremendous degree would take care of this problem because if a lot of Muslims trying to get into the West or already here saw that they could not practice Islam the way that they wish, then they won't want to be here. 
Now, a lot of people will say, wait a minute, but what about their religious freedom? I do not believe, I said this on Clavin also, that religious freedom is a license to break existing laws. Yes, I thought that was a great answer. Yeah, so simple. I mean, yeah, and it doesn't mean that every law is moral. And there is a situation in which you can have a rogue government, and we're getting to that, that could pass laws that any person of conscience is going to have to resist. Mm -hmm. At the same time, when you're talking about things like polygamy, uh, then, you know, I think it's disastrously wrongheaded for the government of the United States. Britain also allows it. Germany allows it for Muslims, not for non-Muslims. Mm -hmm. that, that's, that's a recipe for disaster. Yeah. You know, when I was speaking with Yasmin Mohammed, who is an ex-Muslim who grew up in Canada, uh, she was living out in Vancouver. Uh, what happened there was that she was in a very abusive situation at home when she was a child in an, in, in an Islamized home. And so she went to go and see her teachers and her teacher actually in that day tried to help her. Um, and she went to uh, go to court for this. And uh, basically, the, the Canadian courts said, nope, sorry, uh, we'll, we'll allow all of this violence against you in your household because uh, th this is your religion. So it's okay. It's okay for all of this stuff. These, these are laws of child abuse that, you know, are applicable to, to all other citizens in the country. You can't do these things. I mean, now that's probably changed. Now that's probably changed with all of the woke stuff. Uh, because I definitely see, you know, all of these uh, transitioning children and, and doing uh, physical and chemical castration as being child abuse as well. So, so we're, in, we're in this place where we have, again, this collision of these uh, kind of subversive forces of Islam, of our own uh, self-destruction and kind of suicide that are, that are happening at once. Uh, and so we kind of seem to be in that really dark place. But um, mm. on, on the other side, as I was mentioning earlier, there is this kind of renaissance that may be possible. There is what you're describing here about studying the foundations of our civilization. There is more interest in that now. You know, mm. having this kind of discussion, again, is the type of thing that you know, in the 90s, it was like, okay, you know, people are just watching, what is it, MTV, or, you know, some, there were some great movies and things like that, and, and just kind of focused on, on fiction and literature. But now we're having these discussions about our history that I don't think people were as interested in before, which, of course, you know, led to part of the problem of where we're at today. So do you have do you have faith that America will heed this kind of warning and, and other Western nations, Europe, Canada, Britain, do you think that anyone's listening? <laughs> well, I, uh, I'll tell you, history is full of surprises. And so there are certainly many people in America and to a lesser degree in Europe but still many people in Europe as well who have awakened fully to what is going on, to the efforts to subvert and destroy the nation state and establish this global socialist system. And they're determined to resist. And so I, you know, as, as I said on Clavin, as the great philosopher Yogi Berra said, it ain't over till it's over. Uh, I was born in the great state of South Carolina, and the state motto is Doom Spiro Sparrow, while I breathe, I hope. Mm, I love that. That's wonderful. Well, uh, this has been a really great episode, Robert. I really appreciate you coming on. As I said, I love your work. I'm really enjoying Empire of God, How the Byzantines Saved Civilization. People can go check it out. I'll link it in the description below. Um, and they can also find you at jihadwatch.org, where you are director and there are multiple authors writing about all of the things that are going on every day. Um, you can get alerts in your emails, which I do. So do you have any, any last thoughts that you'd like to share? I suppose the main thing is that uh, it's all up to us as individuals 
that we are in a war, but this is not a war being fought with soldiers and armies, and we can't sit back and wait for the army to win a victory for us. Everyone needs to become an activist now and fight for freedom. Uh, it really isn't over, and the more people who join, heed this call and join us, the better chance we'll have a victory. I love it. Thank you so much, Robert Spencer. It was great to have you here, and uh, I hope to speak with you again soon. Okay, call me anytime. Thank Thanks. You.